Authors on the Air. Welcome to Authors on the Air. I'm Terry Shepard. Dr. Marlene Bumgarner's travels mirror an adventure story. Born in the Yorkshire textile city of Bradford in the United Kingdom, Marlene's family sailed to America on HMS Queen Elizabeth, living in Florida and Australia before putting down roots in California. Marlene is a true Renaissance woman, a primary school teacher, newspaper and magazine columnist, a participant in the Northern California technology boom, and ultimately involved in teaching child and adolescent development for over three decades. Her writings include a college-level textbook and a decade conducting the Naturally Speaking column for the San Jose Mercury News. An award-winning educator, Marlene Bumgarner prioritized the pen after her retirement from full-time teaching. Her new book is Back to the Land in Silicon Valley, published by Paper Angel Press, a tome which writer Tara Basor calls A Little House on the Prairie for Grown-Ups. Life Lab's Don Burgett says that Back to the Land in Silicon Valley is a rewarding journey for a wide array of readers, a powerful memoir of young lives. Before we meet the author of this fascinating tale, here's a selection from Chapter 1 of Back to the Land in Silicon Valley. Grandma, why are your gloves way up there where you can't reach them? My seven-year-old granddaughter Stella piped up. I dropped down on my heels and gently asked her to move so I wouldn't hit her with the pruners. I reached up again, reaching high over my workbench, stretching as high as I could. When had a simple activity like retrieving a tool from the pegboard become so challenging? I held my breath, lifted the pruner off its hook, and caught one handle to soften its fall. It landed on the bench with a satisfying clunk. I turned towards Stella. Her upturned face still held a questioning look. The gloves. Why are they up there with your tools? Oh, those, I said, trying to stay on task. I don't use that pair anymore. But why? They're worn out. Let's go back to the garden, lovey, before it starts to rain. Here. We both have perfectly good gardening gloves in this basket, and there are my secateurs. You can cut the frost damage off the morning glory while I trim the broken branches on the persimmon tree. I looked at the gathering clouds, inhaled the rich scent of wet earth. We have just enough time to finish before the rain starts again. I thought I had distracted her, but I underestimated this child's persistence where mysteries are concerned. She began interrogating me again. But why keep those old gloves if you don't use them, Grandma? Why not throw them away or give them to goodwill? Why put them way up at the top of the pegboard where you can't reach them? I could reach them, I said, standing on my toes again and demonstrating. When I held them up, two of the gloves' fingers hung sadly, torn most of the way through, I pulled the gloves onto my hands, the hairs on the back of my neck standing to attention from the way the suede felt, rough on my palm. The stiff leather crunched slightly as I flexed my hands open and shut. A brown scar ran across one palm of one of the gloves. The acrid scent of the old leather tickled my nose. These aren't ordinary gloves, Stella. They're meant for heavy work. I keep them up there to help me remember, I said softly. Remember what? Oh, honey, so many things when I was young and lived on the land. Marlene Bumgarner, welcome. Thank you for having me. Where did your love for nature come from? Well, my mother grew up in a very concrete brick stone and cinder block kind of environment in the north of England. And when she came to America, she just could hardly believe her good luck when she came, especially to the Bay Area. Um, And she immediately started planting 
vegetables and flowers in the little garden that we had. Um, and each time they moved into a new house, she would get a larger garden and more vegetables and more flowers. And so I just grew up with it. There were always fresh flowers on the table. There were always fresh vegetables in our plates. What precipitated your family's move from Yorkshire to the New World? Well, when Dad came back from uh, the war, well, he'd been overseas about four years. The neighborhood we lived in had been bombed out. There were very few jobs. Housing was very limited. England, in fact, had developed uh, a, a es escape route for former military people. Um, they would give them free passage to anywhere in the British Empire. So you could take your family to Australia, to India, to South Africa. My father, unfortunately, was very stubborn. And he wanted to go to America. So <laughs> he saved the money and paid our way. Uh, but we did have a sponsor and, and, uh, and she was an aunt who my mother had been corresponding with since she was a child. And they were the people who owned the chicken farm we landed in, in Florida. Do you have any memories of the trip across the Atlantic on the HMS Queen Elizabeth? Well, it's, I don't remember any of it, but I've been told so many stories. I'm very well aware of the fact that I threw mashed potatoes on the captain's uh, uniform. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, the captain ate with a different family every night, and the night they ate with us, I was throwing mashed potatoes. <laughs> and between Florida and California was Australia. How did that come about? My father's two sisters had decided to take the free passage to Australia. And a few years later, his parents followed them. I, I just only recently realized they were my age. They were 73 when they uh, moved from England. They'd never been out of Yorkshire in their life. And they took a ship uh, without their children because their children were already there and went all the way around the horn and, you know, did that whole thing. Um, I was I was very pleased, impressed when I realized how old they were. But when I got there, I didn't know that. Uh, they just had, were one big happy family living in a huge house and we joined them. And how long were you in Australia before the move to California? We were there two years the first time, and I started school there when I was five. In fact, if you ask me how did I start writing, that would be how I started writing, because they were extremely good at teaching reading and writing. And when we came back to America when I was six, I was reading proficiently and writing uh, quite well. So that gave me a really good start in my schooling. We went back again when I was 14. Um, my dad's mother had died. And his father wasn't getting out of bed. And so my father was called on by his sisters to come and, you know, he was always the favorite. <laughs> so instead of just visiting them, which was certainly a possibility in 1961, he moved us, the whole family back there again. Um, but we discovered that I had kind of missed the boat when it came to schooling. At 14, I was too old to enter the college training track and I would, was actually a little too old also to enter the vocational track. And so they didn't really know what to do with me. Because children take, took an exam at 11 years of age at that point, and then they got streamed one way or the other. So dad, sadly, brought me back to California. And then, of course, he extracted a promise from me that I would get, go to college when I finished high school, which I did. So you only went to college because you promised your dad you said you would? Exactly. <laughs> we couldn't afford it. He didn't even know how to get me there. I had to I had to lean on the college counselors to help me understand the route to college. But of course, once I got there, I discovered that I loved studying. I loved research. I loved writing. So I, I never really stopped until I finished my doctorate. What was your dissertation's title? I was studying learning styles, and um, at that time, the idea of this, the multiple intelligence theory had just come out. And so I was teaching my students, who were college students who were working with preschoolers, how to identify their children's learning styles, and then how to apply what they learned to their own studying. And so that's, that's what I studied. It was a, kind of a practicum. Um, and I learned a lot about learning from doing that. The book is Back to the Land in Silicon Valley. How does the story start? How did you begin your adventures? Well, I was 
making dinner for my husband one night. We were living on Mount Hamilton, uh, which, as you probably know, is where Lick Observatory is uh, located. His parents lived on the top of the mountain. His mother was a school teacher. His father was um, the basic maintenance supervisor. And I was just making dinner for him that night. We were staying with his parents while I did student teaching. And he dropped the, the, the idea on, in my lap. Essentially, he said he found somebody wandering around his office that day and who was interested in going halves with somebody on 10 acres of land. And what did I think? So I thought it was a great idea. Uh, I had always wanted to live in some kind of a rural environment. So we joined this couple who I didn't know. Um, and we went out and walked around the land and went back to their house, did some planning, spent the night there, drank too much to go home, and found ourselves being lifelong friends <laughs> and moving to the land together. That's a very 60s thing to do. That's right out of Haight-Ashbury, isn't it? <laughs> My parents thought I was nuts. <laughs> so you put down these new roots and what happened then? One of the things we d I discovered very quickly was we didn't know what the heck we were doing. Um, we were really naive, and three of us had never lived on the land. And the one of us who had had been a child most through most of it. She grew up on a farm, um, but her parents were teachers. It wasn't their full time job. She Dory turned out to be our teacher, but we made a lot of mistakes. We lost a lot of animals. Our crops didn't come up the way they were supposed to. The man who sold us the property decided that he really didn't want us to live on the land. I don't think he had any idea that we actually would move on to it. He thought we might use it for hunting or um, an occasional weekend stay. But when he discovered we were living there, he did what he could to get us off of it. So that provides the conflict in the story. Without revealing any spoilers, your story definitely has its ups and downs, but you always kept moving forward. Where does your resilience come from? Oh, that comes from Yorkshire. Absolutely. Everyone born in Yorkshire is raised with um, the concept that they can do anything they want. They're better than anybody. They're better than the queen. <laughs> and if you've seen any British television, you'll always recognize the guy from Yorkshire. <laughs> Very James Harriet, right? I mean, that's Very safe. much. <laughs> Born and bred in Yorkshire is kind of the uh, wayward. That's the way that people describe themselves. And my father always said, you were born and bred in Yorkshire, love. You can do anything you want. Sounds like your father was a huge influence in your life. Oh, I adored him. I did. Yeah. What was so special about him? Well, he used to let me go into his uh, shop at night. He always had an extra set of jobs that he was doing for pen money. And he always had either a garage or a workshop. And it smelled so good. It smelled of sawdust. And he would let me sit on his bench. And he, even when I was five, six years old, he would give me a hammer and a, a couple of nails and some soft wood and let me hammer them in. And eventually he taught me how to drill a hole and how to put a screw into it and I think I enjoyed the fact that he was just there for me. He was, it was him and me together. We went fishing together. Um, it was a pretty special life for me until I was 11. And then when I was 11, my brother was born. And so he moved into the garage and I was told to cross my legs and act like a lady. That screwed everything up. <laughs> I sure did. Marlene Bumgarner is our guest. The book is Back to the Land in Silicon Valley, published by Paper Angel Press. Give us some context about when the story takes place. When did you move out to the land? We moved out there in uh, 1973. My daughter was born in 72, so she wasn't even a year old yet. She was about eight months old when we moved out to the land. We borrowed a travel trailer from my in-laws, 16 feet, and we lived in that our plan was to build a geodesic dome. What we had absolutely no idea about was what it takes to go through the permit process to develop a piece of land in Santa Clara County. And that was a real lesson for me and it took years to learn it. I made many trips to San Jose and waited in line to apply for one more thing and then be told what the next thing was that I would have to apply for. We had, to, we had to clear the land. We had to um, check and make sure that the well pro produced enough water 
and that it was good water. We had to do a perk test and that meant we had to put in a septic tank and we had to put in a water tank. We had to put in our own telephone poles. There was a lot of development that went on over the next 10 years. Why do you think the guy that sold you the land wasn't happy with the way you were going to develop it? Well, he liked having free reign for his horses. He didn't like to house them in a, in a pen. Um, we woke up many times to having the horses poking their noses in our in our gardens or in, our, in the front window of our trailer, <laughs> eating and knocking over barrels and eating the goat food. So the horses were a real menace. He also liked to hunt on the land and he didn't really want children around. Um, that's the only thing I can think of. He never said he didn't want us on the land. He just kept harassing us. And as time went on, it got worse and worse. What was your motivation for writing the book? I thought I was writing it for my children. It turns out they're not terribly interested. <laughs> one, one daughter, my stepdaughter, had been after me to write it all her life because her story begins when my story ends. She was born in 1980, and I married her father um, in 1983. And she always knew that there was this piece of my history that happened before her, but she never knew what it was. So as she grew up, she became a social worker. Um, she took her own family life courses. She began to ask me questions. And eventually she went to a memoir um, weekend retreat and encouraged me to do the same. So she's been my cheerleader all along. And when I finally had the book read, written, she read every single page. And she gave me lots of good ideas for improvement. Um, and she saw things, errors, and also areas that needed expanding that only a family member really could have seen. So I'm very grateful for that. I dedicated the book to her. We talk about the business of books on the program. Tell us about the process. How did your book go from idea to publication? My first experience in publishing a book was very traditional. My first book was published by St. Martin's Press, and I, I really lucked out. I sent out three query letters, and all three were interested. And Paul DeAngelis was my editor at, at, uh, at, at St. Martin's Press, and they did the publicity. They lined up radio shows. They did all kinds of things. So who was I to know that that isn't the way things were done anymore? I wrote the book in complete ignorance. <laughs> Started looking around for a publisher, discovered I needed an agent, started looking around for an agent, discovered I needed a proposal, uh, kind of backed my way into it. But one day I was talking with a, a woman at a, an organization called Shut Up and Write. I, I attend Shut Up and Write groups pretty regularly. They're very motivating. They're very helpful for getting work done. And we were sitting at a coffee table and, and she had just told us that her second book was being published and she was working on the third. And so I grabbed her right away and said, who's published your book? Would there be any possibility I could meet this person? And she said, well, you know, he's looking for new books. Yeah. So she introduced me to him. He read my book. He read the he, actually what I sent him was what you just read. I sent him the prologue and the message that came back to me was, where the heck is the rest of it? <laughs> So I was very delighted. It's a small press, um, but Stephen Radecki and, and Paper Angel Press is at like a group of friends. Um, we meet online at least once a month and chat about what we're writing about and where we're going. And he has been very generous in offering a publishing space for people who have good ideas um, and are good writers, but don't necessarily have uh, a real following yet. So I'm very, de I'm just delighted that with the, the, the process. Paper Angel Press does have a fantastic reputation within the writing community. Did you discover them through an agent? Is that how you made the connection? No, I didn't. I discovered them through my friend who was one of their authors. Um, she has written a trilogy and I, a very good mystery trilogy. And, uh, and I enjoyed the books and I thought, well, this is good quality. And so I asked, I am actually looking for an agent for my next two books. I have two more in process and they're, uh, one of them is nonfiction and one of them is a novel. And I think I need an agent for those. And, 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 uh, Stephen agrees with me, actually, he would like to see, uh, the, the nonfiction book published at a, a larger publishing company that can go 
a little further with it than he can. Tell us more about Shut Up and Write. Okay, well, I'll talk about it before and after the pandemic because it's quite different. So originally, I was just looking for a writing group and I went on to Meetup, which I was already a member of, um, and looked for writing groups in Santa Cruz. And I saw a couple and I joined a couple and they were they were groups where you went and, and read your stuff and people critiqued it. That was helpful. But I wanted motivators. I wanted people I could talk to about writing, about, you know, what, what's wrong with this paragraph here? Why, why is it not fitting right? You know, that kind of thing. Technical stuff. And one day in my mail, my meetup mailbox came an invitation to go to this meetup meet that was called Shut Up and Write. And the blurb about it just said, come to our meeting. We will check in for 15 minutes and then we'll sit there and write for two more. Uh, two more hours. And uh, that sounded good to me. So sure enough, um, I started meeting with a group. We met in one coffee shop two days a week and a different coffee shop on Saturdays. And so three times a week, I would meet with this group of people and it grew, we grew over time. We got, we put our little sign on the table and people would walk up to us. What is this shut up and write thing? So we went from two to three people to six or seven to eight or nine, which is one reason why we met more than once a week. And I, I invited people to my house for a Saturday workshop, gave them, you know, eight hours to write free of charge. And we had a potluck lunch. We had a good time. We had a Christmas party. Um, and then it got to be March. And all of a sudden we couldn't go back to our coffee shops anymore. So we started exploring the possibilities of Zoom. Now, the interesting thing about Zoom is you can join our write up in Santa Cruz from anywhere in the country. And we have people from all over the country. And um, now I'm going to shut up and write meetings almost every day. Um, and they tend to have six to 10 people. And two or three of them will be from somewhere besides Santa Cruz, which is always a lot of fun. It's been very, very helpful for a lot of people to get motivated and to just sit there and write with the sounds of other people. We leave the Zoom window open. You can hear people tapping away on their on their screens, um, on their keyboards. And then we meet again at the end of the two hours and talk about how well we did. Marlene Bumgarner is our guest. The book is Back to the Land in Silicon Valley, published by Paper Angel Press. What was the hardest part of the book to write? Oh, the accident. I won't give away too many things, but I had been avoiding writing about the accident for many years. I had most of the book written, but I still hadn't, hadn't gotten my head around how I would offer this to people. And um, interestingly enough, it was reading another memoir. Am I going to remember the name of it? Educated. When I read Educated, there was a, a pretty bad accident in the middle of that book. And the way she presented it really helped me understand the way in, in which I would wanted to present my story. Uh, but it was painful. And in fact, there's a lot of parts about writing a memoir, I think, that are difficult for people because you have to put your head around where you were 20, 30 years ago. Um, my husband and I were absolutely madly in love at the beginning of the story, and we'd fallen out of love by the end. And I never really understood how that happened. And it was writing the memoir that helped me understand it. So in that instance, writing was a therapeutic experience. Absolutely. Yeah. It helped me come to terms with it. And I had written a fairly decent portion of the book before my former husband passed away. And he actually is the one who had suggested that we contribute, we both contribute to a Google Doc um, as a timeline. And he wanted to do it mostly for our children so that they would know what happened um, in what order. And, and I started filling in the gaps, started writing story and showing him what I was writing. And he loved it. Uh, he didn't, for, unfortunately, he didn't get to see the end of the book because he passed away before I finished it. But I knew that I had his support and we had come to terms with our youth and our errors. Um, I don't think we could ever have stayed together. I don't know that there was another way to make that happen. Um, but we did forgive one another and it, that was that was a good thing. Your book has generated uniformly positive feedback. Why do you think it resonates with so many people? Well, I think that the thing that, uh, that really makes me um, feel good is that they tell me it's a great story, that it touched them, 
um, one, one reader said it touched her both emotionally and intellectually. And I think my favorite one is the writing appears effortless, the pace perfect, the, the detail complex. And I happen to know that that review was written by a very proficient writer. And so that's high praise indeed. One reviewer speaks for many when she says, Marlene's writing seems effortless. I know it isn't. Where did you learn the craft? Well, I do give Australian schools um, the benefit of the doubt. I think that they started me off really, really well. Um, They had exercise books rather than separate pieces of paper. Each child had an exercise book. And so I still have my exercise books from age five and age six. And they were having us write little essays as early as age six, you know, paragraph length essays. And they were teaching us what I... um, what a topic sentence was and how you build a paragraph and how you move forward. Um, They weren't talking about scenes, but I have applied that information to my writing of a scene. The other thing um, I think that helped me a great deal was I kept a journal and I wrote in it. We called it a diary in those days, but I kept it in, I kept a diary every year of my life after age six. And when we went to camp, I was the newsletter writer, um, when I joined a church, I was the newsletter writer, you know, or whatever organization I was part of, I was a newsletter writer. And then I actually wandered into the field of technical writing, kind of accidentally, trying to put myself through college in 1968, 69, 70. And I was a technical writer for 10 years. So that, that really honed my skills. Our guest is Marlene Bumgarner. The book is Back to the Land in Silicon Valley from Paper Angel Press. For a decade, you wrote a column called Naturally Speaking for the San Jose Mercury News. Tell us about that experience. Um, That was a a really good, I forgot to even mention that when we were talking about how I learned to write. That was a really good practice because I had to publish something every week. Um, It was about how to use this new thing called natural foods. Natural foods were popping up all over the place. And in my experience, meeting the parents of my children's friends, uh, they were wanting to participate in this new food revolution, but they didn't know how. And I had been, fortunately, a little ahead of the curve. I had been living in New Mexico and participating in a uh, food co-op. And then when I moved to Morgan Hill, and I started my daughter in preschool in Gilroy. I joined a foods co-op in Gilroy. So I was learning how to use these foods from the very beginning. And then, of course, I opened a natural food store and I had them available to me in, in whatever quantity I wanted. So I wrote the, uh, the column in terms of a one recipe a week and a little bit of an introduction to that food first. One of my favorite resources was Food in History by Ray Tannehill. That was really my Bible and that and the nutrition uh, almanac that came out of the Food and Drug Administration that was my earliest um, guide to what vitamins and minerals were in each different food. Uh, Now you can go online and find that information, but at the time you couldn't. (laughs) So I would write a little history of the food um, and I would write a little bit about how it had been used Oh, maybe by the Babylonians or by the Greeks or by the Indian uh, continent. And then I would give them a recipe to use the food. You were in college at the height of the Vietnam War. How did that impact your point of view? Well, I was a little slow to catch on politically. Uh, My parents, because of them being immigrants, had not particularly participated in uh, in electoral discussions. They did become citizens while I was still living at, well, while I was in college. They had to go to to, uh, citizenship classes, but they weren't really talking politics. And I was a little naive and I was a little out of it. I actually remember walking over bodies that were between me and the classroom that I needed to get to and going into class. (laughs) Because for me, going to school was such a privilege Um, I wanted to get there, you know, no matter what. While I was living on the land, however, I began coming over to Santa Cruz, driving over the hill from um, from Morgan Hill to Santa Cruz and taking um, classes from Ellen Bass. And it was impossible to be in a classroom with Ellen Bass and her students and not know what was going on politically. 
Um, I did. I did go to one consciousness raising group in in New Me- in uh, Washington D.C. when I was there about the time my first child was born. But I must admit that a lot of what went on in that meeting went over my head. Um, Interestingly enough, Shirley Chisholm was in the same consciousness raising group. And of course, I had no clue who she was going to become. She was just a young mother at that time. Anyway, I, uh, I, think, I think that, that learning about politics came with living on the land, came with attending poetry slams, talking to people like Ellen Bass and learning what I didn't know about myself which was that I had been just hanging on the coattails of the men in my family, my father, my brother, and now my husband. And I was just pretty well looking for guidance from them for everything I did. I didn't make a lot of my own decisions. And that's one of the things that I learned how to do on the land. How did your kids react to your back to the land lifestyle? My daughter really wanted a bicycle. (laughs) She had a goat and she had uh, bunny rabbits and she had chickens, but she didn't have a bicycle because our dirt road really didn't manage, you know, really couldn't manage one. And that was the first thing I got her when we moved off the land was a bicycle. She wasn't so excited about living up there. By the time she got into second or third or fourth grade, she knew that she was living a little differently than all of her friends. She had no television Um, you know, and she didn't have a bicycle and she didn't have a paper route and she wasn't playing soccer or any of the things they were doing. And she wanted that. My son was much younger. Um, All he really wanted was to watch TV, which I didn't let him do uh, because his friends all did. Uh, But so he didn't push back. But when they got to be teenagers, you know, yes, Absolutely. I lived through four teen- teenagers in the course of raising my children as a single parent. And uh, it, it was a challenge and I wasn't always very good at it. I think my, my kids are much better parents than I was. Well, yeah, in the rearview mirror, we always beat ourselves up for <laughs> stuff that we didn't know how to do. I mean, none of these kids come with manuals, right? I mean, you're kind of figuring no, it out on the way. <laughs> The book is Back to the Land in Silicon Valley, and the author is our guest, Dr. Marlene Bumgarner, who has been compared very favorably to author Barbara Kingsolver. Who are your author heroes? She's on my list, actually. Barbara Kingsolver definitely is on my list. Um, I also like um, Louise Penny. She's the one who writes about Inspector Gamache. And I can read anything by Louise Penny. Rosamund Pilcher, however, was my one of my first uh, loves. I went through and read everything she wrote as she wrote it. My daughter, my oldest daughter, lived, worked in a library, uh, which is interesting because I did too. And she used to bring books home to me as they were accessed uh, by the library. She was the woman who did. She was the person who did the accession. So she stamped them and put their little pocket in them and then brought them home to mom. And she brought home, um, what was that book? That was The Shell Seekers. The Shell Seekers was 1987, I think, when Donia was working in the bookstore. And I just love that book. I would like to write a book just like it, although I don't know that it would sell today. You know, that our, our preferences have changed. But I like somebody who tells a really good story. I discovered... Um, Delderfield, I don't know his first names, he goes by his initials, R.F. Delderfield, and he wrote God is an Englishman, which my father read, a very rare for my father to read a book, but with a title like that, how could he not? Um, and then I discovered that there were about 25 other books written by Delderfield, and they were all wonderful stories and sagas of English families from different classes at different times in their history. And, and that was very educational for me, but it was also just a great read. I loved reading them. The final question I always ask every guest, Marlene, is this. If you could go back and give advice to your 16-year-old self, what would it be? I'd say write a journal. I, I think that that's the most important thing. The, um, the most discouraging part of growing old is losing that memory. Um, and when I was writing my novel, I mean, my, my memoir, I had the silliest questions to send to my friends. You know, what was the name of that goat? (laughs) 
<laughs> what year did, did this happen? Um, and, and, and they couldn't remember either most of the time. It wasn't just me that had aged. They had aged too. And my journals were really, they were my lifeline. I would go back into those journals and I could find all kinds of things. I wrote the silliest stuff in there, the detail of who visited us and what we had for dinner, um, what I wore. Amazing. <laughs> so the journal is really a, a, it's a way to learn to write. It's a way to learn. Um, it's a way to keep details available to your older self. Um, but I think by keeping a journal, it also helps you learn how to observe, how to observe yourself and the world around you. The book is Back to the Land in Silicon Valley. It is published by Paper Angel Press and written by our guest, Dr. Marlene Bumgarner. Thanks so much for being on the program today. Thank you, Terry. It was fun. Authors on the Air can be found on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and SoundCloud. We invite you to explore the many other podcasts that focus on the craft aggregated at the Authors on the Air Global Radio Network. Our theme music was written by Pavlo Butorin. I'm Terry Shepard, and I'll see you in the next chapter.